from the R&B rap standpoint. Everybody was taking direction from Dre as far as he knows what he's doing. He just finished doing NWA albums that's double and triple platinum. So you have to have confidence in what you've seen. You you watched this man make money. Warren G was my best friend and Nate Dogg was my best friend. So we formulated 213 and Warren G was a DJ. I was a rapper. Nate Dogg was sing the hooks. We didn't have drum machines back then. All we had was records and turntables and a microphone. And Warren G called me on the three-way and was like, Snoop, I got Dre on the phone, cuz he, he liked the tape. He want to work with us, cuz he want to work with us. I said, nigga, stop lying. And he said, hello? I said, who this? He said, it's Dre. He said, man, that shit was dope, man. I want to get with you. Come to the studio Monday. At that time, it was a dream just to be in the same room with Dr. Dre, you know? Dr. Dre wants us to come to the studio where he is. I'd have jogged up there if I didn't have a car. I wanted to appreciate the game and accept everything that was offered to me and learn and just be a student at the time. They were housed in, in my building, so they didn't have a lot of expenses. You have to understand that the greatest expense in uh, making a record is the studio time. I didn't have a lot of knowledge about the rap or hip-hop scenario, so I kind of let them do their own thing. Some nights we used to stay up there all night and leave to like five, six in the morning. I mean, it had a special vibe up there. You just wanted to be there. Even if you wasn't working on the song, you just wanted to be there because it had that atmosphere. It just was a spot to be at. It was right in the middle of Hollywood, and you know, it was just a place to be for us. And we was young, and we never really had been out of the neighborhood, and you know, we was getting a chance to see it all in bright lights. And this was the same studio that uh, Shalimar, Lakeside, The Whispers, Babyface, The Deal, all of them recorded all their albums in the same studio. Ten or elevating our minds to another level, Dre would be like working with the beats at the time, and he'd come up with something, and depending on who was in the studio at that particular time. It was people waiting all over the world for their album, for Dre's album to drop. The chronic was finished. We had originally thought we were going to be able to distribute the record with Sony. This would have been the first time in history that young guys would have actually had the opportunity to have a distribution deal, what they call a P&D deal, to a major and get all of the money. Sony refused to distribute the chronic. Sony, because of their fearfulness of some of the crazy things going on around death row and their wariness of the, the contractual status of Dr. Dre, didn't want to get that deal done. Because of easy persistence, he had been wronged and he had been robbed for his artists. So he chose not to be a part of the lawsuit. Part of their fears in dealing with rap bands is that some of these gangster rappers might turn out to be real gangsters. Indeed, many of them are. There's any number of these guys go to jail every year. I mean, it's like the first thing that, you know, they go platinum, then go to jail. Dick and I then negotiated a deal with BMG to put out the record. They heard the lyrics, and they said, we're not going to put the record out. Everybody got afraid of putting out any kind of rap records with explicit lyrics that talked about killing cops and stuff. There wasn't nobody out there with us. I mean, it was a time when we shopping the deal. We had an album done. John McClain Jr. came along. When he heard the record, he went crazy. He said, Griff, Griff, you gotta, you gotta give me this. You gotta give me this record. John said, I love the record. Why don't you let me take it to Interscope? An opportunity appeared for a young, aggressive label to distribute Death Row. We had two established industry people to deal with, Jimmy Iovine, who was a superstar producer of rock records, and Ted Fields, who had been a movie producer and produced some hit music. They had some rather controversial acts of their own in rock, Nine Inch Nails. They signed Tupac Shakur, the other hottest rapper in the business. Interscope was out of business. They were getting ready to close the doors. Warners, Atlantic, was dropping the deal and Ted Fields was tired of pouring his personal money in there. So here comes Dick Griffey with the chronic. Dick and I went and met with Jimmy Iovine and we met with David Cohen and we played in the chronic and they said they were interested in making a deal. So these guys told me, he said, look, Dick, we're going to advance you two hundred thousand dollars. Well, in the meantime, what was what was going on is there was no more money. There was no cash flow. Friday, no money. Saturday, no money. Sunday, no money. Monday, no money. Tuesday, they advanced one hundred thousand dollars. 
for which we had to sign as a loan. By Wednesday, Suge and Dre are up at Interscope. Jimmy Iovine got a hold of Dre, said, see Dre, they're doing it to you again, Dre. These guys are taking advantage of you. They then got in touch directly with Suge and said, you know, Griffey was here, he won't make us a deal, but if you bring us a record, we'll give you a million dollars. The man, once again, had done the old divide and conquer. It's real lot of prejudice, and this is the record business. Um, and, and I think they were smart enough to see that whoever this guy, Suge Knight, was, and knowing the track record of the, this producer, Dr. Dre, and you had the legal mind of Dave Kenner there, they've got all the tools in place. Everything that we need is right here. We don't really have to do anything. We have to just fund these guys and do what we do, which is promote records, market records, and advertise records. Jimmy Iovine had to go pay off Ruthless, CZ, Jerry Heller, and have The Chronic distributed through Priority Records. Easy was getting on Dre's Chronic record, like 50 cent a copy and maybe 25 cent. Meaning, yeah, Dre Day, he talking shit about me. But every time Dre Day sell a record, I get 25 cent a copy. After they signed the agreement, I think they realized that they needed to leave, and they did. All of a sudden, they disappeared. Should cut off all ties with, you know, the people he was dealing with in the beginning, and we got a whole new office and a whole new crew. And that really became kind of the, the rupture of the relationship between Dick and Shook and Doc and Dre. The Chronic rolls out and sells 5 million copies, generates $50 million that saved Interscope, made Interscope. We invented something that wasn't out there. So it was fresh and everybody wanted it from the East Coast to the West Coast, period. You couldn't turn on MTV without seeing Dr. Dre. First time I performed songs for The Chronic was with Dr. Dre. And we did like a small little concert in Compton. And man, my brother was singing every word of the songs. And it made me feel like, damn, this is my life right here. To me, it wasn't like, okay, Dre is, is advocating everybody smoke weed. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, my album is dope. Do you understand what I'm saying? My album is dope. Buy it. It was a good record. I know a lot of cats is pissed off behind those records right now because they say they haven't been paid or didn't get credit for it. I liked it. I mean, it was. I was surprised by it. I was happy with it. I, in fact, I still play it from time to time. I don't like listening to his voice on this shit, but I still listen to it. There was a lot of, a lot of tension. An element showed up that uh, my people were not accustomed to. Dre had invited uh, these guys over to the studio. When Shoot came, these guys were using the phone. There was a phone that was in the studio that was reserved for me to call on. She was make it clear to everybody that phone should not be tied up because of my situation, it was hard for me to communicate, so the phone could not be busy. So he told them, hey man, get off the phone. So the guy said to Shug, hey man, we were invited up here by Dre. And Dre told us that we could use this phone. By challenging Shug about the phone and also challenging Shug about his authority that just found himself in an awkward position. The argument ensued. Shug went down to the car and uh, got a gun. That was Shug's domain and no one would talk back to him and no one would go against him. And for somebody to be visiting and taking a stance against him, it was like he had to play that up. And uh, hey, he beat these guys up in the studio. He shot through the wall to scare them. The hole is in the wall over there. The cops came and dug the bullet out. Now. George and Linwood Stanley later sued Knight. He agreed on a $1 million settlement, but only paid a third of it. Deep Cover. Deep Cover, Deep Cover was, was a, a critical success. It was the introduction of Dre as a solo artist. It was the introduction of Dre as a mentor to other artists, in this case Snoop Doggy Dogg. By Snoop blowing up on Deep Cover, I looked at that like we were all blowing up, because I always knew we did music together and always had confidence in our music that it would sell and it would sell worldwide. 
And after the way it blew up with Snoop, it, it pumped me up to like, man, I can't wait till it's my turn because they really do love what we're doing. That single is so significant because it shows these two different worlds that Dre was leaving and where he was going to. Dr. Dre wanted to make a statement that he was a solo artist, that he was a, a good artist on his own and a good producer. The thing back then was we gonna try to come up. That's all Dre used to talk about is coming up, coming up. And the chronic was what was supposed to set it off. Everybody put their all into the chronic album because we seen that not only was this gonna build a record company that we were on, because this was the first album off the record company we were on. This will build all of our careers. And we buy this Dre, whatever Dre wants. It's Dre, Dre, whatever you want. You want this constant Dre, you want this, you want this. It's all about Dre, it's all about Compton and Dre, 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 Dre. Boom. You had Snoop Dogg, who just brought a whole nother style to rap music. He has a voice where he can rap over beats and just rip a beat to pieces. And then a lot of that shit was on the spot, spontaneous, right there. We just putting the weed together like this, breaking it down, putting it in the zigzag. Um, once we twist that shit up and blaze it, if it's the chronic, we're gonna keep it as this. We're gonna unroll that motherfucking toy out and come with some new shit. First of all, you had so many hungry, starving individuals that, you know, wanted to be super. Like